Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My, uh, my first job here is to introduce to you uh, the president of Cleveland State University, uh, Dr. Ronald Berkman. Dr. Berkman. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I, I always like when people start and say this individual needs no introduction and then goes into a 10 minute introduction of the individual who needed no introduction. Uh, I, I just happened um, really just at this moment um, to notice that everybody who is on the panel today um, is in one way or another a partner of Cleveland State University. Um, we had, not, we had not planned it that way, um, really, when we uh, conceived of how to put this panel together. But maybe it shows that uh, we can't go anywhere these days, which would be a wonderful thing without encountering a partner in what we're doing here. Um, and I think that there's no better, for me, um, there's no better stamp um, of these continuing 50th anniversary symposia um, then the panels that we've had, the alumni who have been here, the partners we've had speaking here, um, is really what we hoped would happen, and um, it has happened uh, really almost by, uh, it almost makes me believe in the divine hand, um, except when it comes to the economy. Yeah. In any event, I want to recognize, as I have these others, this is the fourth of a series of symposia for the 50th anniversary. And they have really, and uh, I, I say this with all sincerity, really exceeded my expectations, been beyond my expectations. Uh, um, we've uh, tried to bring as many students as we could um, because these programs are incredibly invaluable to students and they really are for students. Um, so um, each of them has, uh, had a kind of singular identity, and uh, today we're going to talk about uh, STEM education. Um, and uh, um, gee, we, we actually have two partners in our MC Square High School, uh, the Museum of Science, well, three partners, the Museum of Science. I haven't seen Jamie, is Jamie here? Jamie's not here yet? Uh, GE, okay, which has um, a year of the school. And of course, the Science Museum, okay, which has a year of the school. So. Uh, um, David Peirce is, uh, owns our medical center uh, across the highway, um, and again, an amazing partner of Cleveland State University. So again, I want to recognize uh, Dr. Schwartz and Mrs. Schwartz, uh, who have been at every one, and Dr. Schwartz has been the co-chair, um, and we've been provided adequate cover by Julian Earls, okay, uh, who has made it look like we have really done something. Um, and uh, that in itself is not a small accomplishment. So thank you all very much. I'll turn it back to Dr. Bond. Enjoy the morning. Uh, good morning again. I'm, I'm Meredith Bond. I'm Dean of the College of Sciences and Health Professions at Cleveland State. And I, my first job, I think, is to invite our panelists to uh, join me up on the podium, and then I'll introduce you all. Gotta make sure I got the right name, right? So uh, welcome to the Cleveland State University 50th anniversary uh, uh, presidential forum building a STEM pipeline from school to the workplace. So uh, uh, one small note before I introduce the moderator and our panelists. Uh, there's, there are gonna be some index cards available for the audience and uh, students will, uh, ambassador students will pass them around and these are for you to write your questions and then they will be handed back to the moderator uh, who will uh, select from as many of these as possible uh, to, uh, to ask the panelists to, to discuss. You may also uh, use social media uh, and on Twitter using hashtag CSU forum for your questions. So let's begin. Let me start with our moderator. Dr. Woodrow Whitlow is executive in residence at the Cleveland State University Washkowitz College of Engineering. 
Dr. Whitlow came to Cleveland State after a distinguished career with NASA that began in 1979 at Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. He served in many positions for NASA at Langley, John F. Kennedy Space Center, and at NASA Glenn Research Center here in Cleveland. Dr. Whitlow earned his bachelor, master, and doctorate degrees in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT. In his role as executive in residence at the Washowitz College of Engineering, he brings clearly defined goals for the college. He assists the dean in strengthening the college, increasing enrollment and retention rates, adding new engineering ed education programs, and increasing involvement of women and minorities. Uh, welcome, Dr. Whitlow. Now for our panel, Dr. Kirsten Ellen Bogan is president and CEO of the Great Lakes Science Center in Cleveland. Dr. Ellen Bogan has done much in the last two decades to advance STEM education through leadership at four grant-funded national centers. Her leadership at the Great Lakes Science Center includes launching Cleveland Creates, a strategic initiative developed with industry to change the community's manufacturing narrative through STEM education for diverse middle school youth and their families. Dr. Ellen Bogan received her PhD in science education from Vanderbilt University. She serves on numerous boards and committees, including the Cleveland Mayor's Lakefront Advisory Committee. Dr. Ellen Bogan. <laughs> Eric Gordon is Chief Executive officer of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. He served in that position since June 2011 and was chief academic officer for the district for four years prior to that. He's an educator who has experience in suburban and urban school districts as a teacher, assistant principal, and principal. Mr. Gordon is a graduate of Bowling, State, Bowling Green State University with a bachelor's degree in secondary mathematics education and driver education and a master degree in education, administration, and supervision. Mr. Gordon, along with Mayor Frank Jackson, lobbied the Ohio legislators to pass the well-known Cleveland Plan, a revolutionary package of education reform, legislation that's received national attention for strong bipartisan support and a collaborative process. Welcome, Mr. Gordon. Uh, is is uh, Jamie Eric here? I'm not sure if he's uh, been able to make it. So, it's on his way. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Mr. Eric since he's uh, heading our way. Uh, Mr. Eric is vice president and general manager for GE Lighting's North America professional solution business. Mr. Eric joined GE in 2003 and served in various aspects of corporate initiatives and sales. <laughs> is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He served as a field artillery officer in the U.S. Army and worked on business development for startup technology companies. After his Army service, he received an MBA from Harvard Business School. Mr. Eric serves as board chair for GE Lighting's Friends of MC Squared STEM, STEM School, the only high school in the country to be located on a corporate campus, GE Lighting headquarters in East Cleveland. And we'll welcome Mr. Eric when he, uh, when he arrives shortly. Uh, and, then, and then Dr. David Peirce. Uh, Dr. Peirce is president and CEO of St. Vincent Charity Medical Center. Dr. Peirce is a board certified surgeon and served on the medical staff at Lutheran Hospital for 25 years. He also served as president of Lutheran Hospital and as Regional Director of Wound Care for the Cleveland Clinic Regional Hospitals. Dr. Peirce is a graduate of Northwestern University and the Ohio State University Medical School. Under his leadership, St. Vincent Charity has experienced significant growth in the number of physicians on staff and in financial strength of the hospital. While president of St. Vincent Charity, he continues his surgical practice. Welcome, Dr. Peirce. I will now be happy to turn the proceedings over to our moderator, Dr. Whitlow. Hey, thank you, Dean Bond. 
Uh, and I'd like to uh, thank the audience for um, coming out today to participate in this very important topic as we talk about the, the STEM pipeline. And it's one that certainly is critical to the future of this country and uh, the future of maintaining our standard of living because I always say that uh, there's this link that we can't deny between uh, technical and scientific and engineering excellence and entrepreneurship and national wealth. And so uh, to ensure our standard of living, we have to address you know, how do we build this STEM pipeline and make sure that it stays, stays full uh, from the educational uh, phase of our citizens' lives all the way up to being productive members of the workforce. And so what I would like to do uh, is to invite each of our panelists to give a brief opening remark um, and um, we'll keep it relatively brief, about five to seven minutes. And, um, and then uh, we will move into the question and answer phase of today's panel. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Ellen Bogan. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. I, I'm eager to get into the conversation, so I, I will keep this brief. I wanna say there are, are four big issues that I tend to talk about anytime we gather for this very important conversation around STEM education. Um, the first is that we consider strongly talking about pathways in STEM education rather than pipelines. Now, I'm perfectly willing to say that we do push uh, learners into uh, a pipeline where there's very little wiggle room. Um, I think there's far more evidence that we unfortunately have pipelines that take children from cradle to prison more so than from school into STEM careers. And, and I would argue that really what we need to talk about are pathways, right? That there are, are many different ways to move into STEM careers. We're talking about STEM careers that aren't even defined at this point, right? And, and that these many different pathways is a much more accurate way of referring to what we're doing here and what we're talking about is, is setting up pathways and making sure that our youngest learners, our youngest citizens have many different ways to access STEM careers. Second thing I wanted to talk about is that we, we spend a lot of time talking about STEM careers at universities. CSU does extraordinary work around supporting people getting into STEM careers. Um, high schools, we have extraordinary work going in our own Cleveland Metro School District around high schools, certainly at the Science Center and GE and CSU here, MC Squared, and I know we have students here from MC Squared, where are they? There, there they are. <laughs> so those are our students. So our students are a terrific example of high school efforts to, um, to make sure that they have access to STEM careers in the future. Um, but if we're only talking about high school and older, we're really missing uh, a key area of development. And there's more and more longitudinal research that shows that you must start younger. That the kind of identity development that happens for a child around middle school is a critical age. And unless you get at STEM careers and exposure to STEM in those younger ages, uh, it becomes an uphill battle for youth. And so if we're not talking to youth about STEM careers until high school, we're doing them a disservice. Third thing I wanna talk about is that there are a lot of little gaps out there, and in fact, some of them are quite large. We need to spend some time bridging the gap between the latest research going on in STEM education, uh, the latest work going on in the development of new careers, and making sure that we keep that gap smaller, right? There's always going to be a lag time between the latest research and how we implement that in our educational environments. Um, but there are critical things. For example, if you look at our focus on problem-based learning and problem solving, that's something at the Science Center we spend a great deal of time focused on problem solving, um, problem-based learning, project-based learning, right? These are all critical areas. But when you talk to industry and when you look at some of the latest research, what they point out is the skill that is lacking in, the, you know, when you talk to Lincoln Electric, for example, or Parker, or other local corporations, why do they have 60 um, 
engineering technician positions unfilled that they're unable to find people for, one of the skills that they say is sorely lacking is not so much this broad phrase that we have around problem solving, but it's the very specific skill around identifying problems. Right? And we don't spend enough time checking in and making sure there's a cyclic process to science education when we're developing our curriculum, when we're developing our programs to make sure that we're meeting very specific, uh, and I'm not saying we need to, this is, again, I'm not saying it's a pipeline where you're pushing someone into a career, but even at the Science Center, we missed for years that problem identification was really a skill that we needed to include in our work. Same thing, Dr. Wilson referred to entrepreneurship. We spend a lot of time talking about innovation. Um, how much time are we spending talking about entrepreneurship? And again, when you look at some of the latest research coming out of Gallup and other organizations, entrepreneurship may be uh, something that we're not spending nearly enough time on. Very last thing I wanna say um, is that we need to remember that this is an ecosystem of learning. Uh, education has, is neither a, a practice nor a, um, a demand that's ever been put solely on schools, right? Schools are one part of a larger ecosystem of learning. Children learn, you know, from zero to five, there's an extraordinary amount of learning that happens in that time. Uh, as soon as you get out of a formal school system, there's an extraordinary amount of learning that happens. And of course, out of school time is an important learning area. So really thinking about, right, and this is, we see this done very well here in Cleveland in that the Cleveland plan is not limited to what Cleveland Metro schools will do by themselves, but what the entire community does to support the Cleveland plan, right? We get this also with United Way that has stepped forward to say, with the wraparound concept, right, and has put all of us on the spot to say, what are you and you and you doing to support our youth in education? And so when we think about STEM education, we need to make sure that we're always doing the same, that we are thinking about this broader ecosystem of learning rather than putting a singular responsibility on one part of the education system. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Ellen Bogan. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Mr. Gordon. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, I think I'm gonna start by just provoking our conversation a little bit because these panels aren't fun if we don't start by uh, uh, mixing it up a little bit. I would, I would tell you that um, in the K-12 education space, people are racing around all over the place putting in STEM. Um, we, we opened MC Squared STEM. I actually was the person that wrote the original grant. Um, and I would tell you that all of us that are racing around to put in STEM have it completely wrong. So that's my provocation. Now for my kids over here, we got it right, so stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> but, but here's why. Um, if you go back, there's actually a video that I try not ever to let surface of me talking about this STEM school we were going to create called MC Squared STEM, single worst name for a school ever. No one can say it. Um, my worst educational mistake ever was the name of that school. Um, the kids have made it wonderful, but um, a big, big error in trying to capture the notion of MC Squared STEM and then finding out it just doesn't work. That's an aside. Um, in the video, though, I talk about STEM being the Sputnik of our time, and I turned out to be right and wrong in that. Um, what was wrong about it is that it is very different than Sputnik, but what was right about it, and if, if you saw that video, I said very intentionally, STEM is the catalyst for us to redesign how we deliver education, and if it were world languages or if it were arts and culture, I could use this exact same model. STEM is really kind of the theme from which we're gonna redesign the education that kids in this school will experience. And that's why I think in the K-12 space so many of us have it wrong, is because so many of us are out there trying to implement the output, STEM, as opposed to redesigning the processes and the pedagogy that allow for STEM-ready uh, uh, educated people. And STEM-ready turning out to be ready for everything that they're going to face, including STEM. Um, and so, um, where I think we got it right is that we focused our model and, and we are focusing in, in our district on a model that focuses on taking themes, STEM being one that students could be very passionate about, but the arts being another, uh, culture being a third, uh, our in international baccalaureate program that sits on this campus being yet another. All of those with the notion that, that learning should be about hands-on project and place-based. Learning should be about problem solving and identifying those problems and solving them. 
It should be build, building critical thinking skills. It should be fostering creativity, and you can foster and should foster creativity in the sciences. That is not something exclusive to the arts. Uh, fostering collaboration and the ability to collaborate while yet leading a team. Uh, which we have somehow mutually divorced, that somehow you are either collaborative or in a leadership role, when in fact they have to work together. Um, where we focus on building researchers and building people who can present uh, ideas and, and then using rich content to do all of those things. And, and so that's, that's what's missing. There are lots and lots of examples in the K-12 education space of, of STEM programs. They have fancy stuff. Uh, they, they have you know, the, the beautiful redesigned environments, but the instruction and the learning hasn't changed. And if we're going to have a STEM-ready pipeline, or in fact a pipeline for any of the careers that our young people will face, which as uh, Kristen said, aren't even yet defined, then we have to have young people who have been nurtured to figure this stuff out and figure out how to use the information that is increasingly available to them in any format that they wish to make sense of it and to do something with it. And so that means for us, then the STEM pipeline starts as in early childhood. And what are the experiences kids are getting before they even access uh, formal education. It is the formal education pre-K through 12 that we must increasingly shift to all of these functions that I just talked about. It is what happens before, after, and around school in, in centers like our Science Center and many other cultural institutions, which, uh, again, have really moved toward an understanding of the importance of this shift in how we prepare our young people and, and how we engage our young people. Uh, and, and then it's a shift into the, the pathways that allow students to keep moving forward that are soft enough that we're not asking young people to make a decision about the rest of their life, which is far more permeable than any of ours was or will be, um, at 14. So they have to be able to start experiencing enough to find where they want to go, whether it's medicine or whether it's engineering or whether it's arts or whether it's culture, but still flexible enough with all of these skills that they could jump ship and do something completely different. The, the good news is that, that uh, despite some backlash, the philosophy in our country around education has shifted there. There's a lot of uh, feedback around the common core right now. But when you dig into the Common Core, what the Common Core is asking young people to do is to take rigorous content, particularly in literacy and numeracy, which are the skills that allow us, the fundamental skills that allow us to learn everything else, and use that content by applying these skills. Uh, and, and so there's backlash out there saying about all these crazy things people are being made to do. Uh, but when, when in fact, really, we're asking kids to be able to read like a detective and write like a reporter, take information, make sense of it, and, and present it back to us in a way that makes sense where they've, where they've designed something with it, where they've identified and solved a problem with it, and that sort of thing. It is about an ecosystem of learning and a changed ecosystem of learning. And so uh, I just wanted to, I guess, I guess try to change the conversation right from the beginning to, to provoke us to think much more deeply about what is behind the learner that we want to be ready to go to Lincoln Electric or, go, or to go to our universities or, in fact, to lead any of the work in the STEM platform um, in our future. So I'll pause there so we can move into the discussion after we hear from um, our other colleagues. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um. We just blamed you for everything, and you're on. <laughs> that's right. It's my, it's my fault. Sorry, sorry to be late. We had a mix up on the times. <laughs> oh, that's that's am I, okay. Am I up? Um, we were we are doing uh, opening remarks. Um, we can take either Mr. Eric or we can go to Dr. Purse. Uh, Dr. Purse, why don't you go first? I can get, I can get warmed up uh, and have some right. water while uh, while you speak. Yeah, catch your breath. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as a as a non-educator and a recipient of the benefits of the educational system, uh, you know, I couch my opinions in my own experiences. Uh, the reference to the Sputnik era is apropos. I was a child of that era. Uh, the near panic in the following Sputnik and the early space age uh, 
drove the country into this uh, massive emphasis on uh, the sciences, the hard sciences, and I can't say that didn't affect me. I remember clearly uh, my two brothers, seven years and five years older than me, uh, studying both uh, Latin and German in high school because Latin was perceived as the language of medicine and German the language of science. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, things come around again. And uh, I think the focus uh, on the science, although uh, uh, beneficial and has beneficied, ben uh, benefited me largely, uh, uh, should be put in context, again, uh, uh, being controversial uh, and maybe the admiration of those who chose a different path than me. I've always saw it uh, and viewed the arts as uh, uh, something special outside of the hard sciences. And I think the foundation of a well-read individual uh, with a breadth of knowledge and uh, understanding of uh, uh, ethics and philosophy is uh, the greatest foundation for layering of uh, scientific uh, thought and uh, leading that person into career choices that fit society and their and their own personality. That being said, I, I maybe chose the safe route personally. I did the science route because uh, uh, one plus one equals two. It seemed to make sense and it was a way uh, one could progress along. Um, but when I think about uh, the challenges of uh, STEM or hard science-based education, I, I think of three fundamentals. Uh, one, I think uh, there's a need for uh, inspirational focus. Uh, again, thinking personally, uh, my brother, seven years my senior, uh, was involved with the first six-year medical school program in the United States. He was in the second class of that program. and. Uh, I was a grade school student at the time, and uh, being aware of uh, medicine and uh, science in general and the university experience was uh, heady. And I think uh, all of us, uh, when we reflect back to our youth and why we've chosen our particular paths, there was an individual or a, an image that drove us in that direction. So I think that's imperative. The second is uh, obviously a proclivity for the sciences. I mean, I think uh, one has to fit uh, a certain skill set to, to begin this journey. I, I do fear uh, a little bit, uh, again as a non-educator, that some of our testing uh, requirements may, may uh, squash that uh, uh, ember of interest because uh, the sciences and mathematics, is, there's a right and a wrong, and if an early student uh, fails, they might uh, choose a different route in life. Mm -hmm. The third piece, I think, is, uh, and probably the most important piece, is mentoring. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, it's an arduous road, the sciences, and uh, uh, you need the support of uh, family and uh, peers, uh, teachers, and also outside influences, and I think uh, therein is where uh, I think greater emphasis needs to be drawn in uh, summer programs, um, uh, shadowing mechanisms, uh, uh, work-study programs, bringing the student uh, to those involved in scientific-based careers, be it research or medicine. Uh, and uh, lastly, I also think that there should be some more reciprocation whereby uh, those and in, people involved in the sciences uh, present to the school environment in seminar programs or uh, introductory methodologies to excite and to continue to uh, uh, drive uh, students along said course. So again, thank you for having me today and we'll see what uh, I can learn. Well, so, so again, uh, it's great to be a part of this panel. My apologies for being late. Uh, as, as a West Point grad, I owe you guys push-ups for being late. Uh, my, I, I, I can't say I've never been late. My wife's in the audience, Maya, and she knows our first date, I was late. So uh, <laughs> it's happened before, it hasn't happened in a while, but my, my apologies. Uh, so my name is Jamie Eyrick, and uh, the perspective I come at this, this STEM uh, challenge is really from a, a business person. Uh, I lead a billion dollar business here at G Lighting over in Neela Park. And what I'd like to do is just frame up 
that perspective that we have, and we work closely with some of these panelists, especially the guy on my right, and I developed a great relationship with Eric and his team. But uh, first, you know, a couple, couple seconds just on my story, because it's related to STEM, uh, a bit on how GE is approaching this and how GE is collaborating uh, with CMSD today. So I'm, uh, I come at it from a vantage point as a African-American kid born uh, in the Bronx. Two parents didn't graduate from college and being fortunate enough to attend the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, West Point's actually the first engineering school in the country. So the engineering ethos and discipline and problem solving was, was uh, I would say, foisted into me early. West Point tends to, they have a pretty good perspective on most things, a lot of discipline, and engineering was one of those. So I studied systems engineering, and while I never practiced, uh, just the problem solving nature uh, and ability that engineers have uh, in any environment is something that was really imprinted on me early. Uh, at General Electric, you know, we have tens of thousands of engineers around the world. Uh, G's a $150 billion company with 300,000 people uh, globally. But a lot of the problems that we attack, uh, it pays to have a STEM and an engineering and a technical mindset. And GE has had a relationship with educators, especially G Lighting, for over 30 years. And it, some of my predecessors at G Lighting were responsible for separate, setting up a, a sponsor program with Collinwood High School uh, going back well over three decades. And it was Eric who, who brought forward the opportunity to work more closely with CMSD. And I, I attribute Eric and his team for being innovators. Uh, where we are at in, in G Lighting today the, the lighting industry, and you know, we're, we're all surrounded by lights in here, uh, and, and they're not all the new stuff. So, I, uh, Dr. Berkman, I see up front. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we've got some problems, some engineering problems we can solve here uh, today. Um, but, but the world is, uh, lighting's the most dynamic industry uh, in the world, in my opinion, in, in that empirically, 100% uh, of the light sources you have in your home. Uh, in your offices or in your place of employment if you're, you know, work at a factory, are going to convert to LED technology, uh, period, 100%. And not only are they going to convert to LED technology, but we're a part of this movement to imbue software and analytics and sensors into those lights as well. So some of you uh, know this, but, you know, there's a huge movement globally, uh, which is called the Smart City or the Intelligent City. We're actually working with Mayor Jackson and his team today to not just convert the 60,000 street lights in the city of Cleveland, as an example, to LED lights, but also to put in put an iPhone effectively uh, in every one of them. So every street light in the city of Cleveland, eventually around the world, will have a computer inside of it. And that computer will be able to analyze things like traffic patterns, analyze things like parking, availability, citations, study snowfall patterns so you can deploy snow plows. If you're Darnell Brown, the mayor's COO, and you want to deploy snow plows to the right area, you can do that because you can measure uh, the fall of snow. And you'll be able to analyze that data. And, and so that, so the world we are headed into in lighting, and for some of you who've been in, living in Cleveland for years, you're probably saying, you know, that's not the G lighting that I grew up to, you know, with going to watch, uh, you know, the Christmas tree lights when I was a kid. Um, that's an engineering, that's a technology, that's a STEM-guided problem we're trying to solve. So when Eric presented us with, I actually preceded me uh, in my tenure at G Lighting, when Eric presented us with this opportunity to be the first corporation in the country to host a STEM school, host a high school, we jumped at it. And in 2009, we, we made history, and today, you know, GS, the, the last thing I'll say is, you know, it's been a fantastic partnership. Uh, and, and you wouldn't pick a better guy to, to go to battle with, so to speak, uh, than the guy on my right. It is not a perfect partnership, and our public education system is not perfect. And as a, as a kid who was educated in public schools, as was my wife, uh, in many parts of the country, we're failing students, failing them. You know, we're ranked in any measure 20th plus, if you look at math and science scores for our high school students, we're failing the contract we should have with students in the country, we're, we're failing. Eric and his leadership, I think, is a big part of the solution to get right here. And GE 
is stepping up to make sure that we educate the students that are that are part of our STEM school. Uh, we're, we love the fact that Great Lakes starts with them in ninth grade, pass them to us for 10th grade, and we pass them to Dr. Berkman for junior and senior year, and they're hosted here. And we graduated about a 95% graduation rate and have students at some of the best colleges. But we're, we're just getting started. Uh, the part that G needs to play here is going to get bigger and the part that all of us need to play. And I, and I just think a STEM education is one of the best educations you can get. The job force at GE is going to need more STEM graduates. And I'm just thrilled that we're going to have a dialogue uh, about that and we can play a part in it today. Let's thank you, Jamie. Uh, and I'd like to remind the audience, don't forget your uh, little uh, postcards for, for writing questions and providing them to me. Now, I have a, enough questions here to keep us till 6 p.m. Um, <laughs> so we can do your questions and be out at 11.30, or we can do my questions <laughs> and be out at 6. So it's, it's your choice. OK, um, so what I'd like to, like to start, uh, ask the panel, and, um, and, and Jamie, you mentioned some very interesting things about you know, the future of lighting. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could provide uh, your vision yeah. for opportunities for STEM graduates, and uh, why should students and their parents invest the effort and the time and the financial resources mm -hmm. in a STEM education? Great, so, great, great questions. And, and I, I should say, I'd be remiss uh, if I had mentioned Dr. Whitlow is actually a member of our, our board of uh, directors that, that helps with the STEM school for on behalf of CMSD and G. So I, I have to thank, give you a shout out for that, Dr. Whitlow, for serving on that board. Uh, so thank you. So, so I think you're asking, you're asking two things. Uh, you know, why should parents and teachers be concerned? And then kind of just the vision going forward with respect to employment. Look, uh, as someone once told me uh, when I was an 18-year-old, uh, kid, uh, not knowing much about anything, you know, if, if you're if you're an engineer, uh, and I'll use engineering, you know, as a as a proxy. I know it's broader than that stem, but if you're an engineer, you're not going to go without a job, uh, and you can always find a job, and people are always looking for technical skills. That was true, you know. I'm old, uh, so that was true when I was eight in the in the 90s, and I think it's more true today. So for parents and for students, it's a great way to secure future employment. And I also think just if you look at GE, you know, GE, as I said, hires tens of thousands of engineers. And for the problems we're trying to solve, whether it be in the lighting business, and I described some of the new innovation there, or in businesses like GE Healthcare, which is a $15 billion uh, business globally, or oil and gas, you know, many of those are around technical and engineering uh, solutions. So I think it's a, it's a great field that's growing. The demand is growing. And for, for young people, it's a terrific way to develop skills that'll serve you uh, a lifetime. Okay, thanks. Uh, I wonder if I could get um, Dr. Purser's uh, take on that situation, just from a medical standpoint. Yeah, you know, I've always uh, viewed um, medicine, and as medicine progresses, as really uh, uh, applied engineering, uh, the explosion of, uh, uh, that we're all aware of, of the technologic advances within medicine uh, in all uh, uh, areas of uh, science and engineering disciplines from IT. Ten years ago, I never heard of a chief medical information officer. Uh, now uh, they're the key focus in our institutions, and the expenditures uh, towards uh, IT is uh, uh, a backbreaking, I must say. Uh, but uh, advancing in the electronic medical record, uh, also supply movement and cost uh, is all predicated on, on information technology. Then, of course, in the surgical arena, the mechanical engineering concepts uh, that are required. And beyond the physician themselves is the, the growth of uh, those uh, talented individuals that extend us, biomedical engineers, um, uh, physician assistants, uh, even nursing, which is moving to a greater uh, density of highly educated subsets, uh, mandating bachelors and above uh, training. Uh, the uh, medicine will continue, I think, to lead 
and utilization of the uh, highly scienced individual. But I do want to go back to something I, I commented on in the beginning of this discussion. As I watch uh, the youth of today and their uh, skill set regarding um, computer technology uh, and uh, uh, technology in general, I think ever more the ability to interpersonally uh, interact uh, is something that is going to differentiate uh, those of us who may have technical skills. Uh, I think that uh, I fear a loss of the development of those uh, interpersonal skills uh, that I think really drive uh, creativity and engineering uh, and social uh, benefit. Thank you. Uh, would um, Dr. Ellenbogen or Mr. Gordon care to comment on that? I, I think what I would say is um, if you just turn on the news, every day you find another reason why kids and families and educators better be paying attention to the, S the STEM world. This, morning, uh, this morning's news, uh, Amazon has uh, started a product that's about uh, the size of, I don't know, about a quarter, where you can stick it to your coffee pot or your washing machine and uses sensor and infrared technology so that when you're out of laundry soap, you just touch the button and Amazon will ship it to your home. <laughs> Somebody in the STEM world, you know, people, young people uh, are sitting around figuring out how to make life better, easier, com more convenient, and there is an art and science explosion going on that, that this is the opportunity that our kids face. That's just one example. The sensor technology that, that GE is using in lights is the tip of an iceberg of what sensor technology is being deployed to do it, that will just fundamentally change the experience that we have as citizens, and it's everywhere. I mean, I, I defy us to try to find a place it's not. You know, if we think about the theater, theaters are almost exclusively run by technology now. You don't hand fly a scene in and out like we did when we were in our high school productions. A button takes it where it's supposed to go, and it's usually automated unless the stage crew changes the automation. That's STEM technology. So I think it, it's just so much become who we are that, that we, we have no other choice but to ensure that our kids and our families and our uh, teachers and are preparing uh, for a generation who will be immersed in this and will either um, be able to take advantage of being part of this revolution or will be left behind if they're unable to access. Thank you. I think the only thing I would add to this is as we think about uh, broadly about what STEM education prepares us for, right? And I, I want to echo what we've heard from the panel already. Um, thinking like an engineer, having these critical thinking skills goes a long way towards changing the way you think when you're in the voting booth, right? And that's, that's critical for us right now. We need people to be informed, to feel empowered when they walk into the voting booth. When they walk into a, a store and make a decision as to whether or not uh, it, you know, have you thought through whether or not you buy the sunscreen that you can spray on or that you rub on, right? And are you making an informed choice because do you understand the nanotechnology that goes into making the sunscreen that sprays on versus needing the rubbing? And are you willing to use that on an infant? Are you willing to use the spray on sunscreen on a 10 year old? And do you have a rationale for making that decision? Right? These are just everyday decisions now that we have to make. And it's part of the time and effort um, is, is not just towards necessarily a career, but, but living a better life in a very different society. Okay. Thank you. Now, along the, and I see that everyone wants to get out at 1130, so. <laughs> um, and, and so along a similar, similar track. A question from the, from the audience. Aren't you concerned that the market will be flooded with STEM students and the job market will not be able to absorb the population of new applicants from the U.S. as well as from around the world? So I'll start with that because that's exactly the provocation I opened with. If, in fact, all we do is narrowly train people to be scientists, engineers, uh, medical practitioners, 
uh, then we will flood the market with a new group of people. And that's why I say that, that I originally thought of this as the Sputnik of our time. That was intentionally what we did as a nation. Um, if instead we train people to have this broader skill set that allows them to, to go multiple pathways, all of which require core skills of being researchers, problem solvers, collaborators, uh, you know, identifying ideas, uh, finding solutions for them, and using information to do that, then in fact we are actually ensuring that our young people will be able to access a large number of jobs. And so I do think it is a, a we're in a period of time where we need to make a very intentional decision for a long-term strategy where I think STEM actually got into the K-12 space in a very short term, uh, we, have to find, we have to fill an economic void sort of way. And, and that's where I think, uh, fortunately, there are a lot of promising models. I think the work we're doing with MC Squared STEM and in the district is one. Um, David James, who is superintendent of Akron, is here. Their middle school program is an, a model example of preparing students to be these uh, STEM-like thinkers, not simply STEM'd trained deliverers. That's the difference to me in the market. Yeah, thank you. So can I add to that? I, I think part of the question you have to ask is, is the market flooded with whom, right? So um, we, we have to ask ourselves, um, who are we preparing for STEM careers and is there equal access? Uh, we've started launching a program now at Great Lakes Science Center, not just for STEM um, and girls, because we know that there are there are some areas. Medicine is a good example where there is uh, very strong numbers of females participating in medical school and moving into STEM careers related to medicine. Uh, if you look at, and this is Cleveland, so you have to look at how are we preparing our young African American males for STEM careers, and, and that is the greatest underrepresented population in STEM fields, and it's a serious issue, because what gets me out of bed in the morning is thinking that coming to the Science Center, that there is, there is probably some young African-American male or female at MC Squared at the Science Center who is the next Steve Jobs, right? If we don't have this diversity of thought, the diversity of perspectives informing our STEM fields, we are selling ourselves short as a nation, and, and this is where we really lack. That's a great point. I would just add, you know, if you think about supply and demand, uh, I think we're a long way from, uh, from saturating the market. And you know, I, I think it is important to look at this through different lenses. And you know, look, we have most of our CMSD population is minority, but minority. I, Eric, you could probably give the exact number. Well, we're about 85% minority. 85% minority, and and I would ar I would argue, if if that 85% studied uh, went to a STEM school or had a STEM guided education, even if you don't graduate and become a practicing engineer, you're going to find a job at a company who wants problem solvers, people who can think through difficult things, uh, and I think that's valuable. And then the the last thing I'd say is, you know, it's important, and I know we have some students in the audience just looking at the the demographics. Uh, not all some of you some of you are clear are not students in high school. No offense, uh, <laughs> I'm in that group. Uh, but but it is a competitive. You mentioned the global point up front, yeah. right? It it y you all have a much higher degree of difficulty because it is a competitive marketplace. And there's a great book by Tom Friedman uh, called The World Is Flat. Which, which one of the memorable lines is, you know, 50 years ago, if you were a, a B student in Bethesda, Maryland, you were on top of the world, right? And what he goes on to say is, you know, today, if you're a B, B student in Bethesda, I think he just did alliteration, you know, B in Bethesda. If you're a B student in Bethesda, you're in trouble because that A student in, in Bangalore, India is kicking your butt. So what you all need to realize is it's a global competitive world. You have more resources than ever at your disposal, and taking advantage of them is something you got to do. And I, 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 I think we're a long way, Dr. Whitlow, from saturating the market, uh, but it's a good academic exercise and question to kick around, but a long, a long way, a long way from there. Okay, thank you. Okay, this question is to Dr. Peirce and Jamie Eirich from one of our students. And I'd like to thank the students for being here today during their vacation time. So thank you for giving up a giving up a day. 
So for Dr. Person and for Jamie, what are the basic skills that you look for in your employees? And why do you think that the education system fails to meet these demands of their skills? Well, number one, I don't think the educational system fails uh, to meet these demands. Um, I am um, uh, somewhat atypical in my evaluation of uh, uh, talent. I find uh, um, uh, personality, clearness of thought, and uh, uh, the ability to uh, relate on a human level uh, more valuable than a CV. Um, people that present uh, to me all have CVs and they all have uh, the appropriate check marks uh, filled out and in short order uh, you can uh, uh, size an individual and uh, I think uh, begin to probe about the understanding of uh, problem solving rather than the technical expertise in solving a physics or math problem. So again, I think uh, uh, the education, uh, the STEM education, the important part of it is not the content, but the ability to think critically and to be able to express oneself uh, is, again, my opinion, key for future. The ability to express oneself and to lead others. I, look, I think, I think David's got a great uh, view on this. I, I would... Uh, I, I answered a little bit differently. I mean, I, I'd bifurcate. If you're a student, there are some hard skills that you need as you go and you know try to interview with David. If you're coming out of college or high school, you may not be interviewing with David. Uh, and then, and and then there are some intangibles that you have, and some things you got to do that don't show up in a resume. I think you can develop <laughs> both of those. I think STEM helps. But I would tell you, you know, looking at a lot of resumes and them getting screened and some of them I don't see, there's some hard skills you got to have. And if you're coming out of college and you <laughs> don't have certain things on the resume, you're not going to have the luxury of having a conversation around the intangibles. And that's why for students, you know, you, you, you have access and the ability to do that. But you got to realize you're competing against people from around the world who may have these, you know, the first step and the first order and the skills and their, their background. And that's the first step to get in the game. And then I totally agree with David. It, as, as you get in there, there are intangible things that, that come across. Some people are book smart and they're not good in, in practical and common sense. Some people have had great grades and great SATs and great standardized test scores, and they don't connect well with people or they can't communicate well. But don't get it confused. Those primary qualifications are very, very important. And that's what you get at a place like this, and that's what you get uh, if you're in, in high school at a place like CMSD. you got to get those early. Volleying the ball back at you for yeah. a second. Yeah. Uh, I think, we should uh, have some volleying today. Yes. It wouldn't be a good fit. I think, um, of course, uh, one has to have content I, where I – uh, struggle is evaluating that content in a 10-minute interview. Uh, and I, 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 I've been impressed how many times uh, people have presented to me with sparkling scores, yet in the field are unable to make an appropriate decision. Uh, so uh, the interview is the step in the door. Uh, the production on the field is uh, what plays out over time. So it's uh, it's a dynamic process. When I wouldn't do, I wouldn't disagree with that. I wouldn't disagree with that. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Ellen Bogan, uh, what role can institutions such as museums and/or science centers play in inspiring students to pursue STEM careers? So I spend a lot of time saying that science centers, informal science education organizations like Great Lakes Science Center, like Cleveland Natural History Museum, our friends at the Botanic Garden, the Nature Centers. We have, we have so many resources and amazing organizations here in Cleveland that what we do best is we spark an interest, right? So we, we see very much our role in the community is making sure that students get access, that learners of all ages truly get access to different kinds of STEM content experiences, that people get challenged, 
and they start to see that science and technology and engineering math, that they're interesting, uh, that they're relevant, uh, and that there's something that you can get involved in in some way or another. And so a lot of what we provide in our organizations are exploration, um, that stimulation piece. And so we, we spend a lot of time on that. Now, I don't want to undersell the significance of the work at our organizations. Uh, I think it was a month or so. I, I got here less than two years ago. About a month or so into my work, I, I sat down with our CEO of schools, um, who has made it very clear even from today that he takes nothing for granted. And he said to me, <clears throat> the Science Center, yeah, you, you guys do a fair amount. You're just not doing enough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not seeing enough measurable impact, Kirsten. So, so what are you going to do about that? Uh, and he challenged I gave her a month now, to be <laughs> fair. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say this on my first day. He's, he's very thoughtful and kind. Um, <laughs> so we set out this challenge. And I think that's what we have here in Cleveland is, th is this challenge in general to each other to say, what more are you doing? And so I, I'm not going to go into great depth, but I think there are many of the formal education, our, our city leaders who have stepped forward and said, you need to do more to the informal science education organizations. And I tell you, we are. We are lining up curriculum activities. We are lining up teacher training, our, our Center for Innovation in Science Education that we run with Cleveland State. And I see Dean Zach over there, um, who's our core partner on this work, um, that, that all of these organizations are responsible for doing more. And so I would just say, since uh, since I did give her a full month before I came with the ask, <laughs> uh, it, it is it is more. There's you know it, I'm certainly going to take every resource I can and wrap around my kids, but it's really also different. Um, and I think what uh, Dr. Ellenbogen has has led and our cultural institutions has led is is really not so much more but different. And and so it, it's a it's a difference in intentionality. It is what do we expect every single one of our kids to experience, and then how do we design in a very intentional way so that they get that experience? And so, uh, when I came to Cleveland, uh, the institutions were all doing great things, you know, and busloads of kids would go in and out of all of the museums, and and, and they were field trips just like you and I had. They would go to the museum, they would go to go to McDonald's, they would go back to school, and life went on. And what we're doing now is fundamentally different. I and mean, if you think of that, that's raining into the lake. All of the resources of rain going into Lake Erie, and Lake Erie doesn't look any different at the end of the day. But what we're doing now, and it's been led by, by the Science Center and the Natural History Museum and the, uh, the Nature Center and the Botanical Gardens, is an intentional strategy to give a field experience in these STEM institutions every year starting at preschool. So that every preschool child in Cleveland goes through a learning experience at school that gets them ready to go to the Shaker Nature Center then goes on an experience at the Nature Center that was carefully crafted with what kids have already learned in mind, and then sends the kids back to school to, to f reflect and practice and, and present and, and you know, finish the experience, and then actually ends with an opportunity for the students to bring their families back at a family day. And we've now layered that all the way through seventh grade at the Science Center so that over eight years, our kids will have eight intentional designed meaningful experiences as opposed to some kids getting lots of trips and other kids getting nothing at all. Now we're raining into a rain barrel and we're irrigating something with those same resources and some more. But really it was a challenge for us to do different. And I would argue that while we don't talk about it enough, I think it's a significant difference that you would have a hard time finding anywhere else in the country. And again, goes to the difference between simply training people to have the skill to behave in a particular STEM way or training young people to think in a STEM mindset. Um, and so uh, um, she didn't toot her own horn. There's a ton going on about intentionality in a very short period of time that makes a great difference to what my kids are experiencing in a K-12 space. Okay, I'm really glad someone asked this, this next question and, and I get to pick. Um, as you know, many, many of us in my generation who are in technical fields you know, saw the Russians launch Sputnik and then Yuri Gagarin and then this country responded with the, with the creation of NASA 
and our space program and inspired many of us to uh, pursue STEM careers. And this question is, if education is the new Sputnik, we need to create that excitement about uh, uh, science education. How do we, in this day, excite or involve the public to help us build STEM education in the U.S.? So. We're all looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's only fitting that you start, you start that one. So I, I know I'm, I'm beating on the same drum. I'm going to use a very different example, and it's a K-8 school, typical K-8 school example. It's, it's Orchard School. Uh, when we were rebuilding Orchard School, we moved all the kids to the Halley Building, which is up the street in a neighborhood, in a place that had not had a school for a long time. And uh, be, started bringing yellow buses in, parents dropping their kids off, uh, all of that sort of thing. And we had this really big problem with the traffic around the school. So, so, you know, it could be the adults who solve that problem while inside the school the kids are sitting taking reading tests and math tests and this kind of, you know, uh, teach to the test kind of strategy. But what that school did um, is actually make it their fifth grade project to solve. So the students went and interviewed all of the neighbors as part of their language arts curriculum and collected a lot of information and, and then summarized their findings and reported it back. In their social studies curriculum, they searched city codes uh, and met with the councilman of the area to understand what the city responsibility was, how the process worked, and what could be done. Um, in their science and math curriculum, they actually uh, set up stations and counted cars and traffic and collected data and um, studied the options that they might have. And then they presented a solution to the city councilman who actually changed street signage and solved the problem. So what schools can be doing is actually take teaching to its deepest level because there's w all of the stuff that my kids need to pass on that reading and math test were in that project. The teacher didn't have to, and in, f in that case, chose not to teach to that test. And I guarantee you, she got results. So the thing that K-12 can do is actually teach rigorous, deep content in authentic, relevant ways that meet kids where they are with things they care about, and particularly important at, at middle school. Um, but we also have to really do some of the things we're doing with GE as an example. We really have to take a look at meaningful, and, and Dr. Peirce mentioned this, meaningful partnerships around internships and experiences um, and, and really saying to our industries, if you want these um, pathways, you have a responsibility to help shape them too. And so the GE experience in, it was very intentional in that all of the students who are on the GE campus have a mentor. They work with an employee from GE. They, they work with scientists, and they have an appropriate level of access to the scientific research centers. So they're not going to be walking out there with the trade secret for the streetlight, but they've actually touched the streetlight when it was at a point where they could touch it and have worked alongside a mentor who has tutored them, who's had lunch with them, who's brought them into the labs, into the experience in an ongoing way. Not in a driveway, I feel good about myself because I visited some poor kids in the city way, but in a meaningful, in, in direct, ex highly expectant that, that this is the experience that you will have. Um, and, it, and it's not always the STEM scientists. So, so there, are, there are kids who have been in the legal department because they are interested in the law of of, of these sciences and you know what's free information and what's proprietary and why is that and how is that changing in this world where everything is increasingly public right and, and so we have to really um, schools have got to be willing to embrace this and we haven't always been we've always had the shell up of we got this leave us alone but when we do get there we also have to have partners to step in and this is where I'm going to kick the conversation to partners to talk about their role in saying okay so if we we have kids who are now hungry for this. Um, what is it that we do to create that excitement uh, and that relevance for real so that they can actually see themselves going in that place after school's out? So I, wanted, I, I wanted to make one comment, though, because I think part of the question was, you know, what is our, our Sputnik moment? I mean, what, what is the uh, catalyst now for us to affect change? And I think it came up earlier in the discussion. I think it's it's the world pressure that's upon us, the, the success and uh, growth of uh, uh, Asia as an economic and uh, intellectual force, 
and their emphasis on the sciences as as in the 60s i think this is a we are going through this moment that is stem that is what is occurring now is in response to the world waking up and catching up uh, and our um, need uh, to accelerate our training and our experiences so that we can maintain, maybe not exceed, but maintain. I remember uh, an old adage uh, after World War II, if you needed a car built in the world, it had to be built in Detroit. Uh, the world was decimated. Well, that's obviously not the case today, extending from a car to a uh, smartphone. Yeah. So, so I think, oh, I'm sorry, Kirsten, were you go, go ahead. I, I do want to just point out that one, uh, Sputnik is such a perfect example because uh, what Sputnik did was create urgency, right? And, and if you're a student of uh, organizational or, or just um, the discipline of change, you know that in order to create change, you must have urgency. Well, as things have sped up in today's society, uh, we're, we've become dulled to urgency, right? You want urgency, well, it comes across on your phone constantly, every day, all the time. There are urgent messages every every moment. You know, Eric started us out with a good example of, well, turn on the news in the morning, you'll see something, right? So we've, we've almost become, um, our senses have become dulled to even recognizing things like Sputnik because there are Sputniks now every day, right? And, and this is part of the issue is I have great hopes, for example, that um, going to Mars could hone our sensitivities a little more towards an urgency of how will we accomplish this as, as an entire world, um, even if it's not just a single nation. But, but we're gonna have fewer and fewer instances of Sputniks in our lives because Sputnik is every day now. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I would agree. So Eric, uh, maybe I can just give a sense of what our students do at, at GE when on campus. Uh, so so we, you know, GE, we have an expression called uh, say do, S-A-Y-D-O, which basically says, you know, we all say a lot of things, but what do you actually do and follow up on? And, you know, we, we really put uh, a lot of resources, time and money behind our STEM students. And that's from our CEO, Mira Sylvester, to me, to our employees. And we, we volunteer thousands of hours a year. And if you're one of our you know 100 sophomores on campus, you're doing real projects. So you have a sophomore capstone project where, as Eric alluded to, you actually see a product from conception to commercialization. And you work with our team members, you work with engineers, you learn what it takes to put together toll gates to develop the technology and to roll it out. And you work with a team of people, uh, your classmates, your teachers, as well as our engineers. So ju it's just a great environment to learn the skills that it takes in a, in a real world situation. And, you know, we're thrilled with the results. I mean, we graduate, uh, Eric knows this, but, you know, we graduate 95% of our students uh, finish high school. And we've got students at colleges around the country, you know, several at CSU. Thank you, Dr. Berkman. And we just uh, wrote a check for half a million dollars uh, to provide scholarships for those students over the next few years. We've got students at Cornell, Harvard, and all the, the schools uh, in the country. And uh, I, I actually don't, I don't think the equation is overly complicated. Uh, I think it just takes people putting their money where their mouth is and their time where their mouth is and mouths are. And that's many of us in the room uh, who can who can do more of that. And we'd love I mean, we'd love to see more people get engaged in that like the you know, many you are already and many panelists are. But the equation is not that difficult uh, and where we're putting the intentional effort. It's working. I think that's question is industry driving the STEM uh, curricula. I mean, when I, when, you know, the U.S. has had threats, uh, uh, we keep referring to the Sputnik threat, but also in the 80s, I remember the Japanese uh, corporate uh, uh, and the hardware uh, uh, monster was another uh, challenge that was going to overtake the U.S. and the re resiliency of American industry, in my opinion, uh, shone forth, and here we still lead in, in, uh, the software technology, uh, uh, the experiences of Apple alone are, are breathtaking. So how does industry then guide that curriculum? Because 
it seems that the entrepreneurial forces and in industry are what keep us leading. And do 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 your companies uh, drive actual curriculum? I think my my view is it's got to be a collaborative effort. Uh, you know, there's no question that you know Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Twitter, name the technology company that's that's come up that didn't exist. You know, perhaps. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you're creating jobs and you're creating opportunities. Um, but uh, I think it's cl it's a collaboration, you know, because I'd say in the same breath, a lot of the key technologies that actually develop, and, you know, Dr. Whitlow's got three degrees from MIT, so he could probably comment. He could take credit for a couple of those, right? Uh, you know, a lot of the technology, <laughs> and, and a lot of the technology and the innovation that actually develops, develops with these big university research centers, right? So I, I think it's got to be, uh, a, a collaborative effort, but I'm, you know, I'm a capitalist, uh, and uh, you know, I, I'm here today because I've developed a career in business. Uh, my wife has a career in business, and and the the ladder to that and the step to that has been the education that we got. But now we're in a position to be able to change people's lives, uh, our own lives, our family's lives, our daughter's life, and that's because of the the business careers that we pursue. So I, I th I'm probably biased in that. The business environment is certainly a catalyst, and when businesses grow, that helps our communities. And you know, I mentioned the CSU gift that we made. That's because we sold a lot of light bulbs, right? So we were able to get, make a gift to, to, to CSU and do that. And I, I think they're, they're intertwined. I think it's got to be collaborative. I, I think the answer is largely no and slightly yes, um, in both locally and nationally. Uh, so, so I can think of to the fact that industry drives it, or the that fact industry that is driving, or even participating in, in the curriculum design. And so, uh, so I can just think of a number of cases where I hear industry say what they need, um, and and then yet am not able to get them to move from say to do. Uh, so the medical industry, uh, if I hear one more time the lack of entry level technicians. Uh, uh, as my medical t training program sits right behind UH and the clinic. I mean, literally right behind both of those institutions, that I actually am thinking of picking up and moving across town to put it near Metro, where I have more hope that we will move from say to do. Um, and, and that's locally. Um, I, I think nationally, though, it's this. I shouldn't introduce say do to Eric. He's going to take it. He's going to take it and run. <laughs> you just gave me language. Going to use it against me. Yeah. And I and I say that out of great respect. I mean, I, I, these these institutions are doing time. incredible <laughs> other things, but but this is an important question, and, and I think the answer is largely no. I think largely in our country, uh, we we have created a dialogue where industries get to desire better things from their education system without a lot of accountability to do something about it, and. And and I and I think that's a national problem too. And I it, we mentioned I mentioned briefly the Common Core as a fundamental driver for this. The Common Core uh, came out of of a combination of K-12 academic uh, researchers looking at skills that get people career and college ready. So they were rightly designed. But what's actually driving the dialogue in our country is legislative dialogue about what people think and feel, not about what is again driven by business need. What is career and college ready? Um, and, and I'm not, not here to tell people they should love the Common Core. There's lots of ways we can get to career and college ready, but the dialogue that is driving our country isn't actually around career and college ready. It is around uh, empathies about whether we like these things and not whether we need to be training kids in particular ways. So, so I think it's both a local and a national. Now I think there are, are examples that we can build on of where it is done very well. Um, I think we are, as a nation, increasingly looking at the German model, uh, where in Germany it is an expectation of industry to have a meaningful participation in the K-12 system. Mm -hmm. It is just designed that way. Uh, the, the, the system wouldn't work if students didn't actually have to go intern in every industry, not just when they want to and volunteer, but because it's how it's done. And so there are models that we can look at, again, locally and nationally uh, or internationally that can help us make the shift. But I think it's a really important question to call because they think the answer is really no. I think uh, before you go to Metro, you got to talk with me a little bit first. Uh, yeah. the, uh, <laughs> Happy to talk to you. Let's move from say to do. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, of interest, we've uh, entered uh, 
some discussions with the CSU engineering program uh, and the spine surgery program at St. Vincent, which is a quite significant program. Uh, I've always uh, stated that the spine surgeons are applied mechanics. And uh, in these discussions, uh, there's an evolution taking place in the, in the um, uh, surgical uh, arena where traditionally uh, companies would provide uh, technicians with uh, the modifications and changes that come from uh, total joint appliances or uh, back uh, uh, stabilization systems, uh, that instead these should be uh, career pathways uh, and career choices for the ever-increasing technology within the OR workplace, that those ind individuals would not be supplied by companies at a surcharge, but rather would be supplied by the hospital as a career path. Uh, so uh, it's one small example of, of, of the end product trying to drive curriculum to fit the ever-changing needs that are coming. Yep. Let's see, I, th I think Jamie has been promoted to CEO of Cleveland Schools. Uh, this question wants to know, how do students get uh, into Way underqualified for that, way <laughs> underqualified. I was doing so good until a moment ago. <laughs> wow, well, you know. <laughs> Here you go. So, <laughs> So, so how do students get into the GE school? But I think that how do students get into the uh, MC Square STEM school? Yeah, so it's a <laughs> it's a lottery system. We I don't think we've ever been oversubscribed. Eric could answer if I'm wrong. Uh, our ninth grade academy is starting to have waiting lists, um, but it is open enrollment. There are no selection criteria. If there are too many students for the number of seats, we do a random lottery. So the, these are are very. Uh, typical great CMSD kid. This is not the one that we found that has some potential way beyond the rest of his or her peers. Um, and that's why it's a success story. Is it's, it's the school for any kid who wants to have the experience uh, can go there as if it were their neighborhood school. Okay. Yeah, or come see me after, and I'll uh, make sure you get introduced <laughs> to the right. The right. That's how it works in the business side. Go see them; <laughs> they all did it. <laughs> but uh, but look, and look, I and I'm I'm not an education expert. I'm a business guy, and just happens to have the the great fortune to part of my day uh, spend with CMSD students and and MC squared STEM. But we'd love to expand. We've talked about it uh, and bringing in more students. We're about a hundred a year, and uh, my my colleague that curse is probably looking at me saying they have plenty of room. I like uh, plenty of room. <laughs> well, <laughs> side, we'd have to talk more. No, I said, but I think the model is um, you know I, I know results. Okay, uh, the model's working. We've got a ninety-five percent graduation rate. Uh, I think that because it's small and we can really, really focus and wrap up our kids, so to speak, in all the best practices of a Fortune you know, 10 company, uh, as well as what our partners do here at, at CSU and at, at Great Lakes, uh, we'd be able to focus and get results. So we look forward to, to broadening the group and getting more great, great students involved. What drives the student to the program? Is it family? Is Usually it the educational the system is yeah, yeah, I've promoting got this? How does this? I've got an opinion, Eric may have opinion broadly I mean uh, it, it's not as formulaic as you would think we've done very little marketing campaigns it's more oftentimes it's a mom quite frankly to be specific mm -hmm. who hears about it usually uh, see some mothers in the rooms are nodding uh, and kids. <laughs> it's uh, so it's a it's a mom or a parent or a grandparent understanding and it's saying to their son or daughter this is something we I want you to look into and enroll, or it's churches talking about it. And now more so that we've graduated classes, it's the, the alumni coming back to their neighborhoods. Uh, but it's more word of mouth than a marketing campaign so far. Uh, that's what we've observed. Uh, since we've had the board up, we've started to look at it. But Eric, you may have an opinion beyond that. Yeah, so uh, um, the district now actually is, is, we consider ourselves a choice district. We want our kids to choose the option that best meets their needs, particularly moving from eighth to ninth grade. So we also now have a office of choice and enrollment where we do actually market to every eighth grader now what all of their choices are. Uh, we do, we have routinely had choice fairs and school visits and some of the kind of more traditional things, but we have moved into much more non-traditional just-in-time kind of uh, marketing uh, for kids to learn about what 
kinds of programs might best meet their needs. Um, but even within that, when we do our research, uh, lots of decisions are still made uh, typically by moms. And when uh, when Jamie said that the kids' heads were nodding up and down, like, it, you know, <laughs> yep, my mom's the one that found this for me. Uh, and, and so it's about how we do a better job of informing parents what those choices are so that they can uh, make them. As part of the Cleveland plan, we also have launched the Cleveland Transformation Alliance. And it's one of its core functions is to help families make good choices for their children. And that choice could be to stay where you are because it's the right choice. So we don't presume that choice means you must move somewhere, but we do presume that you should have an intentionality about where your child goes to school. And, and it's become a uh, signature element of the Cleveland plan. Do we have any uh, personnel that, uh, uh, not marketing per se, but uh, appoint individual that may speak to the students? As again, you know, I, I do believe in this catalyzing event, a personality that that uh, one seeks to emulate, uh, you know, I, I, I would agree that uh, I'm sitting here largely because of my mother and my father and uh, uh, their demands, but also, uh, you know, chasing a star is part of the, uh, the motivating factor. Yeah, so each school uh, gets to design their own outreach, and so uh, the, the principal of MC Squared STEM, who is actually here with us today, she and her team, working with their board, gets to design exactly how they want to market, who they want to bring in, uh, which schools they want to visit, do they want to go to schools, do they want to bring kids to them. Um, so, so we, as a centralized organization, our strategy is to decentralize and to empower at the school level, which then puts the, uh, both the burden but the opportunity on them for uh, marketing and enrolling in their programs, um, which is a fundamental shift for us. At a, at a district level, though, we also actually have four full-time recruiters who do nothing but visit with kids and families to help them um, both come back to the district and access our very best programs and would sit with the family and say, I have to tell you about MC Squared STEM. Let me take you there. Let me take you to John Hay, where's another great partnership. We were talking about where we didn't always have it right. We have a tremendous partnership with the, the uh, hospitals and universities around a science and medicine campus there. Um, and so would take students there and meet them there. And so it's a both and strategy for us. Um, and again, it really is driven by a fundamental belief that, that um, you know, Cleveland is the home of choice. We were the first voucher city, Milwaukee being the, the close second. We have 70 charter schools, some of which are very good, others of which are just awful. Um, and, and then you had your district school. And the fundamental shift is you should have 100 choices there too and go what's going to meet you best. And so we've put recruiting in place to help families decide, and we've empowered schools to, to be their own storytellers. Very good. I, I would push uh, this question back to the audience. This is a question of everyday leadership. Our CEO of schools has set up a choice situation, and all of us who live or work in Cleveland have a responsibility to make sure that the youth in our community, right, we are neighbors, we are parents, we are ministers, we are coaches, right? Every one of us here influences youth around us. When was the last time that you stepped up in a little bit of everyday leadership and asked youth around you, what are you interested in? What are you thinking about? Do you know about the opportunities that we have here in Cleveland, right? This is a responsibility for every single one of us. We are all recruiters for Cleveland schools, and, and this is something that can't be taken lightly. Great point. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Uh, yeah, one of the questions, and I think you, you just addressed it some, uh, about having to do something at the grassroots level. So what do, we, what do we have to do, not just at Cleveland State University or at the MC Squared STEM School, but places like East 55th in Scoville or West 46th, West 46th in Clark. Uh, so what kind of things can we do? At the, what other kind of things can we do at the grassroots level? Well, I, I would like to comment on that. I think the reciprocal nature of, of mentoring, I think, uh, I, I believe that programs should exist where uh, those in the uh, science-based communities actually somehow become inculcated within the educational process. Uh, that whole idea of creating an image, uh, um, a person of interest different than, than the daily routine that presents in a seminar or question and answer format, uh, even at very young levels, I think would be uh, a 
program to help uh, just lift the vision of an individual to see what's out there. As I said uh, in my introduction, you know, the, when I was in grade school, the idea of my brother at a university and in medicine was uh, magic. Mentor. Every one of us can take one kid and stick with that kid and know that kid well and expect a great deal of that kid and take them on this journey. Every one of us can do that. Every single one of us can do that. And it is the single most powerful and free resource that we have. And I would argue that probably most of the young people here could point to somebody they consider a mentor. Um, we can formalize them through things doing in GE, or you can just find and meet and take that kid with you. Uh, it, it is the single most powerful, and it's free. And it goes right back to uh, Kirsten's comments about the everyday leadership uh, of helping kids and, and, and mentoring not just when it's easy. <laughs> so I was, I was just talking to a colleague who's mentoring a kid who went off the grid. He's at college, 20 outreaches, and the kid didn't respond. And on the 21st outreach, the kid responded. Mm -hmm. Mentoring is not I texted a couple of times, they didn't c follow up, and I'm done. <laughs> it is really sticking with that kid. And then uh, connected to it, and I need to say this, is mentoring because you know what this kid can do and be. Mm. Not mentoring out of a uh, kindness of helping poor minority kids, but making sure that that poor minority kid is treated every bit like the kid who's getting an experience in Beechwood or Shaker or uh, Westlake or Cleveland. Uh, really mentoring because you know what is inside that young person despite maybe where he lives. He's 55th in Scoville or he's 49th in Clark. Um, that would be the one thing that I, I would say. Okay. Uh, this is for uh, Mr. Gordon from one of the students. Oh good, these are always the hardest. <laughs> uh, do you think that um, all schools in CMSD uh, should have STEM classes. And for example, have you considered expanding the STEM focus uh, to all schools in CMSD? Um, I think all schools in CMSD should have problem-based, project-based, um, place-based, experiential-based learning not even just classes, and I actually would push you to think about your day. Most of your day is not about classes, it's about the projects that you work on and how your classes inform them. I don't think every school should do it in the same way your school does it. I don't think every kid would love it the way you love it. And there's reasons you chose not to go to other performance-based, place-based schools, like the School of the Arts, as an example. Um, but I do think, and, and I'm pushing us hard to get there, that, that the way you are engaged in your learning, every kid should experience. And then what content you use as your theme to inform that way of learning should be varied enough that kids can find something that is their passion, their interest. Uh, what brought Dr. Perts to medicine? What brought Jamie to engineering? What brought me to teaching? Uh, what brought Kirsten to everything? <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, so I think it's deeper than that. I think every kid deserves the experience, but the experience has to be produced in multiple vehicles. Thank you. Okay, uh, and I'll ask the, the entire panel this. Uh, so Mr. Gordon uh, mentioned the importance of communication skills, and Dr. Peirce mentioned the importance of interpersonal skills. And I know at NASA, Dr. Earls would not give me a promotion unless I could demonstrate communication, like writing skills, publications, and the same thing here at Cleveland State when our professors come up for tenure. Uh, we, um, we look at publication record and presentation record. Um, could you all talk about the importance, to, particularly to the students in the audience, the importance of developing communication skills to help them advance their STEM careers. I'd like to make a comment about that. And, uh, it just shows my age. Uh, you know, I think I, I would caution against the uh, absorption within electronic devices. I think it's really uh, becoming an issue. And when I see the very young 
uh, not playing or talking with one another while they focus on these wonderful machines, I think, I worry uh, that the natural experiences of life where one uh, has conflict resolution and interactivity, uh, the fighting on the playground or the argument on a baseball game are, are very important skills uh, that uh, take us into our lives as adults in the workplace. And um, I, I, I have serious concerns over this uh, exaggerated focus on an isolated, uh, individualistic uh, approach to experiencing the world through a device. Yeah, I, I, de devices unfortunately soak up a lot of our time, and while many of our students, I think, are very tech savvy these days, they're not all, not everyone uh, is you know, interpersonal savvy. Mm -hmm. So for the students, there's a great article you should read by Daniel Goldman, which is an oldie but goodie, uh, which is on EQ, emotional intelligence. And I think you got to have a blend. And in your role, when you're leading the NASA office, I mean, there's a certain uh, there are, there are certain jobs where you can be very uh, exclusionary and work in a lab on something very finite. But if you want to be, you know, a, in a leadership role uh, and grow, you know, that's not that job. And I think for our students here who desire to to move up into lead organizations and lead teams, like some of our panelists. You know, the, the EQ and Dr. Goldman did a lot of research on this, would say is, is more than half the battle. And EQ is your ability. And I've, you know, I'm fortunate. Uh, Faye McKinnon is our uh, head of schools here, and Andrew Tiemann, two people from our uh, G team, are in the audience. I think they're both brilliant, uh, but they also do a great job of communicating up to, to me and to our board, communicating to students, and building uh, the fabric. Uh, of these teams, which is this just interconnected and the personal connections that you have. So you, you really got to have both. And, and I think one of the ways you can develop those is early on uh, participating in, in sports, community activities, volunteer at your church, where it forces you to, you know, get away from the iPad or the iPhone or the video game uh, and work with, work with teams to, to get things done. I think it's really important to start early. I would add to that, I, I like to say that I got out of um, my work in a lab and moved more towards my work in a science center because of communication. I, I, I worked first at the Michigan Cancer Foundation in a pathology lab when I was in high school because a teacher tapped me on the shoulder and said, did you know you could get an after school job at one of these organizations around town because they're looking for girls um, to have these after school jobs and it paid far more than my existing after school job at that time. So I, I developed this specialty in, in uh, electron microscopy, which in those days, it wasn't a computerized microscope. Uh, so you were in the basement of the building, wherever you worked, right? And I continued this in college. I, I worked in neuroimmunology in college. And again, with electron microscopy, I was in the basement in these dark rooms. And I like to say that I got out of it um, because <laughs> there was no communication. And I like to talk, and I like to be with people. and. And really, working in electron microscopy was a lousy, lousy career area for me. So I, um, I, I moved more into this other interest in science centers and science museums. But the fact of the matter is, um, now 25 years later, I, I reflect back on that shift that I made and, and my glib comment that I got out of electron microscopy because I wanted to be in communication. The fact of the matter is, when I think about it now and, and when I look back at that, um, the most important part of communication is being an expert listener, right? And I very much honed my listening skills. You know, working in the pathology lab, I needed to understand exactly what they were looking for, right? When you're l working at that microscopic level, you need to be crystal clear on what your colleague needs and what they're actually looking for. Same thing in the neuroimmunology lab. and. And I honed a lot of listening skills working in a laboratory in that service technology work that I was doing. So, so in the end, um, a lot of these communication skills can be built in so many ways. But if we don't develop all of us into being great listeners, we're not going to get anywhere. So I, I would agree with all of the uh, panelists. Um, I am actually going to talk about how you can actually teach this in a K-12 setting. How many of you actually learned to diagram sentences when you were in school? <laughs> so 
the theory was that if you were able to diagram sentences, that's how you'd learn to read. There's no evidence behind that. Um, <laughs> true, true. What you learned was to describe your language, and most of you, if I asked you to do it today, actually didn't learn it because you wouldn't be able to diagram a sentence. You learn to communicate by communicating, and you learn to communicate more effectively by communicating more frequently in increasingly complex situations. So if you are going to be a good communicator in the STEM field, you have to read STEM literature, and it needs to be more and more complex every time you read it. If you're going to write well in a STEM field, you have to write in the STEM field. You don't have to just learn writing because writing is very different for very different fields. The, the literature that uh, Dr. Peirce would write would look very different from the literature I would write in the education space. So you have to write in increasingly complex ways in that field. If you're going to present, you have to present in increasingly complex ways. The, the fact is that the way you learn to communicate effectively is by practicing those communication skills in increasingly complex ways which is again why we cannot reduce these two skill sets but have to uh, create the settings that, that these students and many of our students are getting where they actually do have to communicate with the scientists at GE, with the professors at this university, with the scientists at the Science Center. They have to present their findings of their projects to panels and to groups. They have to be able to read and write on that stuff and, and over time will build this wheelhouse of ability to effectively communicate. Um, and, and if you don't believe it, meet a 10th grader when they arrive at GE and meet that same 10th grader nine months later. They are fundamentally different in their ability to communicate because they have had to practice those skills in increasingly complex ways in their entire experience with that, within that profession. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and I'd just like to say I'm not obsessed with my device. This is, this is my timekeeper. <laughs> Okay, uh, another question uh, from the audience. Uh, I'm glad to know that we're in intentionally focusing our STEM efforts in the K-12 arena, but I'd like to know what we can do to redirect some of this focus to our 18 to 22-year-old young adults who didn't necessarily benefit from this emphasis on STEM education and might be good candidates uh, for support in entering these fields. I guess I would start by saying there's, there's um, an increasing intentionality about the workforce retraining uh, for the 18 to 22 year old who may be underskilled because of a system like mine that failed to serve them well. Um, but there's increasing intentionality about retraining through apprenticeship programs, through uh, skilled certificate programs, through that access the, the industries, the STEM industries. And then I think one good thing about uh, the STEM industries that the science, the evidence is showing us is that the, the certificates and the degrees become stackable. And because the, the organizations do need this capacity, this is a place where the institutions are taking on the responsibility of if I can get that entry person and I can see the kinds of things that Dr. Person mentioned that you don't just see on paper, I am willing to keep them on the journey. And so we can actually reopen a door for people who, for whom the door's been closed. And, and while it's not my day job, I actually intentionally serve on a couple of boards with, with that mission in mind, be because there really is a pipeline. And I would actually argue that we've been much more intentional about getting ready to retrain people after they have failed to get what they need in K-12 than we have been at actually making sure they don't need the retraining in the first place. I think there's more intentionality in the retraining space. Mm -hmm. I, I, my opinion is that, you know, the, the early education is always emphasized, but sometimes I think it does take a maturation of the individual to, to understand their place in the world and the needs necessary. So I, I, I personally think uh, that later push, that 18 to 24 year old is, is the individual that really uh, needs uh, guidance and interactivity with uh, the workforce and educational institutions or hybrids thereof. Uh, I think that is probably the most crucial time. Let's see, could the panelists talk about the importance, the importance of and the benefits of a diverse and more inclusive STEM workforce? And how do we increase the participation of women and underrepresented minorities? I'll, I'll, I'm happy to start. Uh, with a, a general comment about diversity and then maybe more uh, specifically about what 
what we can do about it or maybe what we are doing about it. So uh, there's actually been good research uh, done on this, uh, empirical research. Uh, and if, you, if you're bored and you have time, uh, there's a woman named Robin Ely uh, and a guy named David Thomas from Harvard Business School who did research on diversity and the performance of teams. And the long and short of it is diverse teams perform better, comma, to the extent they're in the right environment with the right leadership. So uh, I believe in that premise. I believe in the data. And it's our job to not screw it up with bad leadership uh, when, we, when we have that environment. So uh, I think especially when it comes to solving very difficult problems, diversity across race, gender, uh, disciplinary uh, background comes in very handed, handily because you have a multifaceted approach. Uh, so what we're doing about it, uh, you know, 80% of our students, I believe, certainly sophomores are African American. Uh, not enough of them are women, I would tell you. So we're probably closer to 20%. Andrea and uh, Fee could give the exact number. Uh, but we have cluster groups. Uh, we have Girls in STEM, which is a program that G Corporate and G Lighting are sponsoring uh, to help young women develop a passion for STEM disciplines. And that's something you know our uh, CEO, Mario Sylvester, uh, has personally championed. And you know just providing more visible minority mentors uh, at G Lighting is something we try to do as well and have people tell you know, their stories uh, and then making sure that our board is representative of what we want our students to look like and aspire to. So you know, Dr. Whitlow is a member of our board. Uh, we have other African American members of the board and 40% uh, of our board is, is women. That works directly uh, with Fee McKinnon and, and the students to help augment what the school is trying to do. So those are just a few things that we're, we're trying to drive. Okay. I would add to that that um, taking the pipeline concept, one of the issues we have to admit um, where we're lacking is at the beginning of the pipeline and at the end of the pipeline. <clears throat> and Eric already talked a bit about this, that, that there are a great deal of efforts that in the end result in uh, a young person saying, well, where's that job that you guys talked about, right? And and it's not, it's not everywhere, but we, Absolutely, I see this, I've seen it multiple times in the same way that Eric talked about, where um, we either fail to make the direct link to get the youth into their career, uh, and so we have this diverse population coming out of an education pipeline and not getting the jobs they deserve. Um, but then we also have a, a, a leaky pipeline, right, where again, at the top of the pipeline, um, we're losing people far too often, uh, our most diverse uh, scientists, engineers, doctors, right? The pipeline is leaky most around diversity. Uh, and so that's where the partnerships come in. It's where partners like those at the table are so important, where we make sure that the conversation is not just about what are we doing for our students, but what are we doing for our young professionals? Um, and until we figure that out, right, I, I think we can spend so much time, all of us have these great girls in STEM programs. I think there's an increasing focus on how we're supporting young minority men in getting into these careers. Um, but until we make sure that the top of the pipeline is fully inclusive, we're not gonna be there. I, I would say that, um, so the research to Jamie's point is really crystal clear about the, the real importance of diversity when the conditions are created for it to work. And then to uh, Kirsten's point, we do have a top of the pipeline problem where the conditions are not often conducive. Uh, so I think those are both really critical points. But I would just also point to something we know intuitively, uh, which is if we are looking for problem solvers, for people who are persistent, if, for people who um, you know have the grit to figure things out, to, to you know, th all of these s w soft skills, that's my kid, right? Mm -hmm. That's my kid that has made it through the th urban education experience where so many fall off. That could, that should be the, we should be going and getting those kids because we have to hone those skills to the business experience, but they have them. They have had to take three buses to get to their school. Mm -hmm. They have had to get up and take care of themselves after they drop their mom and or their brother or sister off. Like all the things that we often think of as inhibitors of 
uh, poor and minority and urban kids are actually the skills that we admire most in our best workers. And so we have research telling us how powerful they will be when we're able to create conditions for them and they're right here. And so taking advantage of the assets that our kids bring instead of considering them as weaknesses gives us a great opportunity to fix this problem. Okay, our, I think this will be our next to the, to the last question, and this one is to Dr. David Peirce. And it's, uh, it's a concern about uh, having the right number of doctors graduating from U.S. <laughs> med schools to serve the huge number of us aging uh, baby boomers. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it takes a, a long time, uh, a lot of effort and a lot of money, to, um, to become a, a medical doctor. And um, so what do you tell students about persevering to get that medical license, uh, how they can pay for that education, and if there's debt, um, the rewards that await them and why they should not be afraid of that effort required and the debt that may come with that education. So, so I tried be to combine a, about be three or afraid, four cards. Be very afraid, no. <laughs> Um, well, you, you've, you've hit a major concern that's happening right now. Um, uh, the educational requirements continue to increase, and quite frankly, the compensation is uh, dropping uh, rather precipitously. Uh, the uh, Medicare payment schemes have been frozen for uh, well over 15 years, and the real dollars earned have uh, dropped significantly. And, as a hospital administrator, mo many people don't realize today that uh, hospitals are taking uh, now the burden of uh, physician salaries. The, uh, the uh, independent doctor with a uh, shingle up and a private practice is uh, um, uh, fading into the past. Uh, the hospitals in general uh, with um, uh, hired medical groups uh, lose on average of uh, fifty to one hundred fifty thousand dollars per physician per year. Uh, the expense of an office uh, uh, is usually uh, uh, double again the individual's salary. Uh, the overhead associated with extenders, secretaries, uh, paying the rent uh, at all. Uh, however. Um, that all being said, uh, medicine is still attractive because of, uh, uh, of the nature of what one does in that career. The ability to interact on a very personal level uh, with a patient is uh, not to be corny, is a privilege. I, I think of it every day, um, especially as a surgeon. Uh, uh, it's uh, a little, uh, um, uh, gives me pause when a person meets me and then allows me to uh, operate on them uh, with a 10-minute uh, interaction. It's, uh, it's uh, a, a great responsibility, and that does have significant wards, uh, rewards in and of itself. With regard to meeting the needs, uh, this is a problem. It's recognized, and there has been an extreme growth in uh, the extender physician population. Uh, physician assistants uh, came into being in uh, the early, uh, you know, mid to later 60s as a uh, medical corpsman in the Vietnam experience, uh, particularly in the California environment, were brought in to assist uh, surgeons uh, in the practice of their uh, task. Uh, it grew from a medical corpsman uh, uh, entity uh, without any additional education now to master's and doctoral based training uh, entities with prescriptive privileges. And I myself couldn't run my daily life without my physician assistants uh, and nurse practitioners with all, which also have prescriptive privileges. So this is one way uh, the needs uh, are being met is by other avenues of uh, professionals uh, supporting the cause. Uh, but uh, I am concerned about the expense uh, associated uh, with medical education. Uh, many young people come out with several hundred thousand dollars worth of debt and uh, a long time frame to pay that back. 
I know it's corny, but I think the privilege of uh, being a physician is worth it. Thank you. Okay, and then finally, um, I have a question from a student. Uh, as a high school student, what words of advice would you give me wanting to go into a STEM field and, and why? So um, I would like to ask each panelist as, as we close uh, to give some words of advice um, to the students in the audience. Well, since I'm in the left-hand part of the podium, I'll start. Um, you know, not to be corny, but I think anything that has value has cost. It has, uh, one must uh, uh, put forth uh, uh, serious effort to um, achieve something, and the value of that, if it, if it is easy, I, I don't think the satisfaction and the achievement is there. It's... Uh, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about uh, children today getting trophies for showing up at a, a t-ball game. I think it has that value. The, the person that struggles, uh, learns, achieves, and is, is valued by society, it's because it was a tough road to hoe. That's my comment. So uh, I'll give you three things. Um, one is a, a mindset uh, response, and then this the next two are, are actions. Um, so I, when I was uh, when I was young, uh, I got great advice when I was a student at West Point. I was 20 years old, and Colonel Sales, who uh, you wouldn't have any reason to know him, was the first uh, African American to lead an academic department at West Point. It's a big deal, and he led, coincidentally, the electrical engineering and computer science department. So a lot of STEM focus. And I was getting ready to go out in the army. He gave me a quote, which, if you're, you know, a student, you should write down, uh, which, which is, uh, "The enemy of excellence is good. Prioritize for excellence. The enemy of excellence is good. Prioritize for excellence." So it goes to what you've heard from some of the panelists. But uh, you know, you, you've, you've got to set the highest expectations for yourself. And uh, it's a failure when we let our kids aim low. So if you're a student, you should aim high and set high expectations. And if you keep that in mind, I think it'll help you make decisions. Uh, as well as focus your time on the right things. Uh, the second thing is, you know, seek out an environment where it's more about the learning than the title or the location or the, uh, you know, the sexiness of the job, so to speak, because you're in the learning years and wherever you can learn the most. And sometimes those are, uh, and, and you heard Eric say it, you know, our, our, I think many of our kids are ideally suited to the difficulty and the adversity of these learning environments. But just so you know, the, the challenges that uh, many of you had early in life continue. And so find the, the toughest learning environment you can find. And then the third thing is, uh, you know, find a great mentor, coach, leader, boss that can help shepherd you through those tough times. And once you, you know, I'm a, I've been mentored by some of the, uh, the finest GE leaders we've had. And I see uh, my friend uh, Terry Trotter, uh, pe peeking in the audience, his, his brother, uh, Lloyd Trotter, uh, was a mentor of mine. And uh, the best mentors are like great basketball coaches. They, uh, they, they want you to do well, but they're going to kick your butt until you, you are perfect, right? So <laughs> find somebody like that who cares uh, and wants you to grow and develop and, and to learn. So that's, that's what I'd leave you with. So I would say don't do it unless you love it because you are this is what you will do the, you, you know we all spend a great part of our waking life working at whatever we chose to work at so if you love it do it and do it grand do it great do it big but don't do it just because it's the stem field do it only because it's your passion it's what you enjoy and it's what you want to be doing um, and then when you ch choose what to do don't forget that you can do it here in Cleveland too many of our kids feel like the only way to get to do this work is to leave home, when in fact this whole panel is about our needs right here at home. Uh, I'm a very proud graduate of Detroit public school system, and 
uh, I would have to say that one of the things that helped me the most uh, was just being willing to say yes in many situations where my first instinct was to say no. When my high school biology teacher tapped me on the shoulder and said, you should apply for these jobs that are open, well, I wasn't straight A's in my science classes. Um, I, I couldn't even imagine why she was asking me to do that. Um, in, I can't tell you how many times you know people in my life have tapped me on the shoulder and said, you should try this. And my first instinct, I will just be very honest, and this is something that I think that particularly women will struggle with. The first instance is, oh, well, they didn't mean to ask me for that, right? Um, I, you know, I was invited, uh, before I even finished my doctorate, I was invited to go take a job working at King's College London. And so, you know, take off, move to London. And I said no, right? Because what, moving to London, who does that? No, thank you, Th that's so kind of you to think of me, right? And then I went home and I thought about it and I talked to other people and I thought, what on earth did I just say? I went back and I said, yes. Right, so there are going to be many, many instances, and sometimes there are very little things where you just say, no, I don't have time for it, or no, that's not exactly what I was thinking I wanted to do, where your first instinct is going to be to say no. Take a deep breath, say yes, and give it a try. Yep. Okay, I, I want to thank the panelists for their very, very wonderful insights. <laughs> and it's 1125, and our host is going to step forward and do something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to also uh, reiterate uh, Dr. Whitlow's words. It, I think it was both an energetic and an energizing discussion. I want to thank all of the panelists but it was a team effort. I want to thank all of you in the audience as well, and I think a round of applause for all of us. Yeah. Now, um, we heard quite a bit of it. I think the theme of today's discussion was very much say do. Right now we can stay eat, or we can <laughs> grab and go. <laughs> the food is out there. And finally, I want to take this opportunity to remind you about the next, the upcoming President's Forum, but please note that the date is correct. It is April 27th, but it is Monday, April 27th. So really hope to hear, see every one of you here. Thank you all again, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.